Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, now, um, if I just give you all a chance, if you want to turn your chairs around, um, there's nothing worse than getting a sore back. So feel free to get yourself comfortable if you need to move your chairs, uh, point around, get comfortable. Um, I did give Stuart a challenge tonight, and I did give him a challenge to make something so disgusting uh, that no one would want to drink it. Um, and I think he, uh, he passed that challenge, didn't he? Um, especially when the gloves came out. Uh, we will have to ask him later if that was really what he was suggesting it was. I wouldn't put it past him, uh, but we can find out later. Maybe kids, you can find out what was really in that drink uh, later. Um, so, uh, we're thinking about uh, the darkest night tonight. And so I want to start off with thinking, what's the darkest place you've ever been? So I don't know if you like camping. It might have been when you're way away from the city. Uh, you're, you know, there's no light and it's a really dark night. That might be the darkest. Uh, maybe at home when you've had a blackout uh, and you realise, actually, what's life like without light and without electricity? You realise how black it is. Uh, we've got a funny story uh, that you can ask my daughter Ainsley about, that we were on holidays uh, with our cousins, uh, or with Ainsley's cousins, and the room where they sleep is really dark. So if you put the curtains down and, sh and they shut the door, it's like pitch black. Um, and Ainsley actually woke up with her cousin in her bed, um, and they were both completely disorientated. It was so dark, and they were like, no, this is my bed. And Matilda was like, no, this is my bed. You're wrong. No, the wall's here. No, the wall's here. And they're upside down. And so they ended up sleeping the rest of the night in the same bed because uh, it was that dark. And it was hilarious the next morning when they were trying to explain uh, their midnight drama to us all. Um, now, I reckon one of the darkest places that you can get to is a, turn it on, um, a cave. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been into a cave, but uh, you go deep deep, deep into the cave, and uh, we've done it on a tour, and I don't know, you get right in, and then what they get you to do is turn off the lights. So you get right in, turn off the lights. Now, that is darkness, isn't it? Uh, that is what pitch black is. You put your hand up, and it's this close to your eyes, and you wouldn't know your hand is there. That's real darkness. Now, you might have heard the story about the Thai soccer team. They're four boys and their coach. And uh, one day after practice, uh, they went to a cave um, to do some exploring. Uh, but while they were there, uh, the, you know, like today, but imagine today, but a lot worse, uh, it rained. It actually, there was a flash flood um, and they got trapped. Um, and um, I'm going to read a bit about what it was like for them to be in this cave. <clears throat> It says they needed to get out, but instead they had no choice, but they had to scramble deeper and deeper into their cave. They found themselves finally marooned, marooned on a small rocky shelf about four kilometres from the cave entrance. They were swallowed up by an unforgiving mountain, surrounded by darkness. The boys and the coach lost all sense of time, fear, perhaps even terror, would have no doubt crept in. And they were there for eight days, eight days on their own in the dark. Uh, this picture, uh, this picture was taken the very moment that the rescuers got into the cave. This was the first thing when the rescuers surfaced. Uh, can you imagine what it would have been like, how those boys would have been feeling, all the fear, the darkness, the despair, and then how they would have felt when that light came up and their rescuers were there. What an amazing thing. Now, there are other types of darkness in the world, aren't there, than physical darkness. Uh, there can be emotional darkness. There can be a spiritual darkness. It can feel like a weight, a burden. Sometimes it can feel like we've got a sense of dread. It can feel like an anxiety, like we're not sure about what's going to happen. And often in those times of darkness, we feel incredibly alone. We feel all by ourselves. Well, tonight we're going to be learning about Jesus and his darkest moment. What happened to him? What was it like? How did Jesus get through it? And you see, for Jesus, it occurred also at nighttime. 
and it occurred in a garden, a place called Gethsemane. You can still go there today. It's a real place uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, Gethsemane. <clears throat> but first, we need to catch up. Uh, so who is Jesus? I'm going to give you the Jesus. This is what Jesus has been up to to this point in 90 seconds. So it's going to be a whirlwind. But Jesus had spent the last few years of his life traveling around and he'd been teaching people, uh, teaching people a very simple message, really. But the message was the time has come. Uh, the kingdom of God is here. And his message was it's time to change. Uh, the kingdom of God's coming and it's time to change. So turn, turn back and turn to God. And now wherever Jesus went, there were crowds and the crowds followed him. Uh, but the crowds were divided. There were some in the crowds that said, wow, who is this? His teaching is amazing. Uh, he speaks to the sick and they get better. But there were others that were afraid of him. And what he was doing was challenging them. And yet again, there were others who were offended by him. Who does this guy think he is? Coming here, trying to change us. Uh, claiming that he is God's son. But day by day, Jesus kept teaching and he was traveling and he was actually going in a direction. He was moving closer and closer to Jerusalem. And what he said is, when I get to Jerusalem, uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to be rejected. Israel's leaders are going to reject me. I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to rise again. And so our story tonight, it picks up right at the very end. It's the last night. Within the next 12 hours, it was all going to be ha it was all going to happen. We are right at the finish line. And let's have a look. Uh, Jesus has just had a meal with his disciples, a bit like this. Um, he's just had his last meal with his disciples. Um, Jesus has seen uh, one of his disciples, Judas, actually get up, leave the meal, and go off to betray him. And Jesus knows that's about to happen. And then Jesus has looked at the rest of his disciples who are left, and he knows that in a couple of hours, they're all going to bolt. They're going to run away and leave him on his own. And so that's where we are. It's late. It's dark. They're all tired. And uh, they head out. Let's see what happens to Jesus. They head out to a place called Gethsemane. Uh, so they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said. Stay here and keep watch. Now, have you ever been overwhelmed by something? Uh, it might have been that assignment where you just underestimated how much you had to get done, and you are up for all hours, and you have no idea how you're going to get through it. Uh, it might be that time when you've got a million things on at work. And there's lots of stuff happening with your home and you just don't know how on earth you're going to get through it. It can feel like the weight of the world is on you. It can feel like there's this tightness in your chest. You can't think straight. You can't imagine how you're going to get through it. It feels like you can't breathe. You see, that's what it's like for Jesus here. He is overwhelmed. Uh, he is deeply distressed. He's troubled. Um, he's not being melodramatic. Jesus isn't, isn't just, he's not, he's not just hamming it up. Uh, it's not some act. He is genuinely and deeply in pain. He's alone, anxious, worried, scared, sad. It says he's overwhelmed to the point of death. Which brings us to the question, why? Why? Why is Jesus overwhelmed? What is it? That has him so troubled. In verse 36, Jesus asks God, he prays, and he asks him for something. Uh, he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Now, you know how to work out when someone really wants something? Uh, they ask for it three times. Uh, so I'll try and prove it to you. Uh, Dad, can I have an ice cream? Uh, my response, no, you didn't actually finish your dinner. There's no way you can have an ice cream. Not going to happen. 
a little bit later, Dad, please can I have an ice cream? You don't need it. It's not good for you. You don't need an ice cream. And your mum's out in the school and you need to get back. She gets back and finds you've had an ice cream. Please, please, can I have an ice cream? Please. Now, that's the point that I normally pay. <laughs> um, I don't know how, the, the, but anyway, it's just, it, I just normally pay. And then you're trying to hide the rubbish and make sure they don't see it. Um, she doesn't see it when she gets home. Um, it's really hard to say no to your kids when they ask for you, ask you for the same thing multiple times. Um, Jesus prays three times. Three times he prays and asks God for the same thing. He says, God, all things are possible for you. You know that. He's, that's God his father. God can do anything. All things are possible for you. What does he ask for? Take this cup. Take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. So what is the cup? Now, it's not, a, it's not a real cup. It's not a drink. It's not like, you know, the drinks that Stuart put out in front of us. Uh, the cup is it's a, picture, a picture. It's a metaphor. Um, you might remember the picture from our cup, right? So uh, from our cup, there were some that were nice. Well, I think they were nice. The kids that had them, they were nice, tasty drinks. Uh, they looked pretty good. They were sweet. Had a bit of ice cream, a bit of sugar, a bit of fizz. Uh, some were not so nice, although Wayne seemed to really enjoy his uh, Vegemite and peanut butter sweet chili uh, uh, concoction. Yeah, it tasted good, like a fine vintage. Um, yeah, and some were, um, you know, some were, try not to spill this one anyway. I mean, like, you can come and have a close look at this later, right? Some were absolutely no chance, not so nice dirt, whatever that may hypothetically have been from the toilet, um, disgusting. Now, if we were to put our lives into a cup, what would it taste like? If you all mixed it all together, like a potion, like this one that I'm trying to get my daughter, Clara, who loves this thing behind me to look at. Um, if you mixed it together, what would it taste like? Um, you see, the cup, that, um, the cup that Jesus is talking about here, it's actually, it's, it's a picture for the cup of God's wrath or God's anger. Uh, let me just explain it. So God made us. He made us in his world. And he made us, um, in, in a, it's an amazing world. Um, and as part of this world, he made light and darkness and he separated the light. And God made us to live in this world and to follow him and to follow his way, so to live in the light. Um, so if we were to put our lives into a cup, what would it taste like? Would we have uh, looking out for others? Uh, would we have putting others first? Would we have being nice to our brothers and sisters, not directed to anyone uh, would we have um, been thoughtful? Would we have following God in our cup? Or in our cup, would we have putting ourselves first, getting angry, losing our patience, losing our temper, taking the best seat, the bigger slice, putting others down, doing what's best for us? What would be in our cup? Which cup would your life be like? Now, I'm sure there'd be some good bits. I'm sure there'd be some nice, sweet bits. Uh, but I'm sure there'd be some bad bits too. I know for my own life, there's lots in my cup that I would not be proud of. But what about if I mix it together? Do the good bits make it taste good? Do they make the bad taste go away? Do they make me want to drink it? Uh, now, the Bible tells us the answer. Uh, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, it says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things while in the body, whether good or bad. And Romans 3 says there's no one righteous, not even one. You see, God sees all that we do. He sees the good, the bad, um, and he keeps it. It's all in a cup. 
Uh, there might be some sweet bits, but in our heart of hearts, we know there's a lot that is not good. Uh, God mixes it together, and the conclusion is it doesn't taste any good. It does not taste any good. You see a drink uh, like in front of me that has been polluted, corrupted, tainted, it cannot be right just by adding more sugar. As the Bible says, there is no one right, not even one. You see, what we do matters. It has real consequences for how we live our life. We all need to appear before God and we need to give an account. We need to explain to God how we've lived. It's called facing judgment. Uh, The Bible talks about this. This is the cup, the cup that we need to drink, the cup of God's anger, all the badness, all the consequence for our life we need to drink. And you know what the ultimate consequence is? Ultimate consequence is death darkness, separation from God. That is the ultimate consequence and that will be our darkest moment. You see, when Jesus says to God, take this cup from me, he's not saying take his own cup. It's not Jesus' cup. You see, Jesus' cup was overflowing with goodness, purity. Uh, Jesus never did anything wrong. He never had anything that would have tasted bad. Uh, But he's not talking about his own cup. When Jesus says, take this cup from me, it's our cup, my cup, your cup. And Jesus is saying, take this cup from me. Um, And why is he saying that? Well, however bad it might be to drink this, this dirt and who knows what else is in it, However bad this is, um, the cup that Jesus actually drank is way, way worse than this. Uh, So the cup that Jesus had to drink, um, so that very night, within an hour, Jesus was arrested. Um, All of his disciples ran away and left him. His closest disciple, Peter, three times before that morning, denied knowing Jesus. Jesus was put on a fake trial in the middle of the night. Uh, All these people told lies about him. Uh, He was convicted. He was taken to the soldiers. They mocked him. They put a crown of thorns, dressed him in a robe, hit him, saying, Hail the King of the Jews. Uh, He was sentenced to be crucified. He was led out. um, He had to carry his own cross. He was taken to a place called Golgotha, and there he was crucified. So he had nails put through his hands and put through his feet. Raised up on a cross, humiliated, naked, to die. The cup that Jesus drank, the ultimate consequence, death, separation from God uh, for us. That's what Jesus did when he drank the cup. Uh, Three times Jesus prays. Take this cup from me. Uh, But at the end of his prayer, you might notice, he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Um, So you know the Thai cave rescuers. So this is a picture of one of them. They're pretty ordinary blokes. Um, I watched a documentary on them. Uh, In fact, they're actually a bit odd. And I think maybe you've got to be a bit odd to be a cave rescue diver. Um, apparently they were always a little bit outcast growing up. Uh, they were a little bit different. Um, but they're amazing guys. So to rescue the um, Thai soccer team, uh, they had to travel through some of the hardest, most dangerous diving that you could ever do. Four kilometres in the dark. Uh, so it was flooding. So it was all muddy strong currents, like some of the spaces. I'm claustrophobic. I would hate it. But you have to squeeze through these tiny little spaces. You can easily get lost. You can get trapped. You can get stuck. It is, it is some of the, it's, there's only, they said there were only like four or five guys in the world that actually could have pulled this off. Uh, it is that hard. Look at all the gear and equipment that they needed to take. So when they went to rescue them, they went 4Ks in and they got to this chamber that they thought, this is going to be the spot, the most logical spot that they're going to be. So there was like a beach and it was a bit of a bigger cave. But they're like, if they're anywhere, they're going to be here. But they get to this cave and they're not there. 4Ks in. 
um, they've got to watch their clock because they've got um, they've got like an, a, a point uh, where their oxygen paths are on, and they've got to you know they've got to go back, otherwise they don't have enough oxygen. You know they could run out on the way back. So they're at that reserve point. Everything's telling them that they need to turn around. Everything is telling them that they need to get out of that cave, that they've done their best. Uh, but they knew what was at stake. Um, they kept going, but even into the part that they shouldn't. They went another 400 metres, popped up, and that's where they found the boys. It was amazing. Yet not what I will, but what you will. You see, Jesus did not want to go through what he did, but he did it because it was God's will. It was what his father wanted, and it was the only way that we could be saved. Three times Jesus prayed, but three times his father God strengthened him, gives him the strength to endure and to achieve victory. And he did it for us. He did it because he loves us, because he cares for us, because he wants to rescue us. It's the only way. It says it well here. 2 Corinthians said God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, on the cross, Jesus endured the full judgment of God on our behalf. And at the end, those very last minutes, moments when he was on the cross, uh, the last thing he said before he breathed his last, the very last words were, it is finished. It is finished. The cup had been drunk in its full. The price had been paid and he had dealt with the sin of the world. We had been rescued. And this is what we celebrate at Easter in a few days. Uh, Good Friday, we remember the cross and what Jesus went through. And then on Sunday, three days later, Jesus risen to life. The two meet him. Uh, victory. And so to our final point. Uh, the final one's missing. Well, that's it. It's life. That's life. Now, uh, the final point is, and it's a bit of a test, really. Um, there is another page, but it must have hidden. Uh, is, are we awake? Uh, do you ever find it hard to stay awake? Um, I don't know. Maybe for the kids, is it a maths lesson? Uh, hot day for us adults. You've had a big meal, a big lunch. End of a long week. You might be watching a movie late at night. Um, I can't seem to stay awake. Uh, don't take this. Where I am, but on a bus trip, I always fall asleep on the bus. Something about the heat and the rocking. But um, yeah, the bus is where I seem to struggle to stay awake. Um, sometimes it's even hard to wake up, isn't it? So um, you stayed up late, uh, you got to get up for work or for school or for uni. Hard to wake up, isn't it? Um, the disciples, they couldn't stay awake, could they? Three times Jesus went to pray. Three times he told them, stay awake. Three times he comes back and they're falling asleep. Three times. Don't they realize what's happening? Don't they get what's going on? Now, Jesus says, pray, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Should we feel sorry for them, the disciples? I mean, it's late, it's night time. They would have been tired, stressed. Should we feel sorry for these disciples? Or should they have known better? Jesus, the one they followed. This was the end. They could see how distressed he was. And he asked them to stay awake and they let him down. They fell asleep. You see, sometimes I reckon it's easy to go through life being half asleep. And we have busy lives, don't we? We're always racing around, lots of things to do. We don't get enough sleep. Well, I know I don't. Uh, there's too much happening. We might have stressful jobs or lots of things on at school or uni, busy family schedules. It's really easy to go through life half asleep. And I reckon it's also hard to wake up when we're totally plugged in and connected to um, our technology, whether it's this, an iPad, a computer, a screen. Um, I don't know if you've got um, screen, I've got screen time on this. So I went and had a look at it today and it told me that over the last week, I've averaged 
110 pickups of my phone every day. So that's like eight, eight every hour, eight pickups. Like what value is that giving me? Um, work? Or just like, you know, is it just to distract my brain? To get, like, why am I doing that? Like, am I awake? Do I even realize I'm doing it? Um, but it's hard to be awake to our world, our lives, to God, uh, to who we really are, to what God is like. These big questions, and often it's easier to go through life half asleep. I want you to imagine that you're in that cave. I want you to imagine that you're there. You've been there for eight days. You don't know what day, what night. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to get rescued. I want you to imagine that moment that you see the rescuer come up, the light surface. And the rescuer comes to you and it says, it's fine. I'm here. I'm here to rescue you. I'm here to save you. It's time to go. I want you to imagine that you say, no, I'm good. This cave isn't too bad. I might stay here. I think I've got a little bit of Wi-Fi. Uh, so I reckon look at YouTube or I can uh, get some Facebook or watch some movies. I think I'm good. The flood water is rising. The rocks are sitting there falling. Now, I know that sounds extreme, doesn't it? That sounds really extreme. But actually, that's the situation that we're in without God. You see, God is light. And if we actually don't turn back to God, it says that we're stuck in the darkness. It's like we're in the cave. Uh, without God, we are without light. We are without hope. We are in the dark and the water is rising. You see, all people are destined to die. It's the one fact that we cannot escape. Uh, some sooner, some later. But we cannot escape death. And when we die, we will face judgment. We will all stand before God. And so, and so the choice, as I get onto my last page, Owen, the choice is uh, when we stand before God on that last day, he will hand us the cup to drink. And if we are on our own, we will have to drink that cup. If we are on our own, we will have to drink that cup. We will drink the cup of God's anger. And we will deal with the consequences for how we've lived our life. But if we stand with Jesus, God looks at us, he looks at us as he looks at Jesus. Um, it doesn't, Jesus has dealt with the sin. Uh, we will be welcomed into the light and we will have eternal life with God our Father. And so I'm going to leave you with this question. Are you awake? Are you awake? Have you seen the light? Um, have you realized what Jesus has done for you? Uh, what he endured, that cup that he drank for you? Have you been rescued? Have you left the cave? Have you returned to God? Now, you might have been awake to this uh, past in your life years ago when you were younger, uh, you, but you might have drifted off. Well, what a great chance for you to come back. What a great chance for you to come back and to actually say, no, I want to be yeah, you, you might be starting to stir. You might be starting to see, I'm starting to see something. I'm starting to, starting to wake up. Um, if that's so, that's great. That's fantastic. We'd love to chat to you more about it. Um, keep asking those questions. Keep working through it. Uh, but you might have actually woken up to much tonight. So this might be something that is um, new and has opened your eyes and you've seen what Jesus has done. You've decided to leave that cave and to be rescued and to start a new life with God. So what should you do about it? Well, for Jesus, he prayed. And so for us, actually, it starts with a prayer as well. So if this is something that you've woken up to, it's a, it's a very simple prayer. And you can pray this anytime. Um, I'm going to uh, go through it now, but you, can, you don't have to. You can pray it now or you can pray it, uh, you can pray it anytime. Uh, but the prayer is very simple. It's three things. Sorry, um, thank you, and please. So sorry, I'm sorry for how I've lived my life. Um, I'm sorry for the things and for where I've um, ignored you, God. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done, for rescuing me and forgiving me. Uh, please, please help me to live my life for you. Uh, so very simple prayer. Um, I'm going to pray now. I'd love you all to bow your heads. If that's something you want to pray along with me, um, uh, please, I encourage you to do it. Uh, Father God, 
I realize I have not always followed you and my life has not always honored you. I'm sorry. Thank you for sending Jesus that he drank the cup that was reserved for me, that through the darkness I have light and through his death I have light. Please help me to live a life that follows Jesus. Amen. Um, so it might start with a prayer, uh, but, but it doesn't end there. Um, and following Jesus actually changes everything. Uh, so what we would love to do is actually, um, we'd love to be on the journey with you. So there's actually um, in your um, outlines in the middle of the page, and I might just ask everyone to grab one and to grab a pen. Um, but there's just a, a chance for you to let us know where you're at. And I'll just go through what the options are. Um, so if you put your name, um, we are not going to contact you if you don't want to be contacted. But if you do, do want to be contacted, we would love to get in touch. Uh, so the options are, if you put your details down, uh, you can say, I prayed the prayer to become a Christian. Um, if you were sort of in that just starting to stir category, um, there's this great Christianity Explained course, which just sets out in a lot more detail what I went through. Um, so that's a great thing if you just want to get some more information, that second box. Uh, the third one is we love having everyone here, especially new people. So if you want to join a church or just get to know more about our church, uh, we would love you to tick that third box. Uh, the fourth Fourth one, even if you didn't really enjoy today, you can tick that one and be polite, or you can even write on the back and say, I didn't really enjoy today. But um, that fourth one is just, yeah, it's been great, um, but um, that's kind of the, you know, we won't, we'll leave you alone if that's the one you want to tick. Um, and if there's another one that you just have an issue or something you're working through um, and you want someone to come and pray with you or talk with you, that last box, um, if you, um, yeah, just fill in your details, put them on your um, page, uh, sorry, on if you filled them all in. Um, even if you come regularly, it's good for you to fill them in um, and just leave them on the middle of your page. We will collect them. Um, but that's it. I will hand back to Stuart. <laughs>